that seems to be working. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Welcome to this, the sixth week in the long-term animal research seminar series. Uh, we continue this week with Dr. Fernando Campos. And before I introduce Fernando, I'll make a couple of announcements. First, if you look at the either the bottom or the top of your screen, you'll see a Q&A tab. Uh, and if you open that tab, you'll be able to type any questions that you have, as well as see and upvote other people's questions. At the end of the talk, we'll go through those questions, starting with the ones with the most votes. However, if you have a clarifying question that you feel like needs to be addressed during the talk in order for you to understand something, you can type clarification in capital letters at the start of your question. And Fernando has said he'll do his best to answer those questions in real time. Second, recordings of all of the talks will be available on YouTube shortly after they conclude. So if you need to leave early or know others who are unable to attend live, uh, the talk will be available for viewing and reviewing after it's complete. And third, um, we are still taking nominations for the fall semester for this series. So uh, we'll do that. We'll keep that no those nominations open through probably through the rest of the week. Um, so if there's people who you've had in your mind who you want to nominate but haven't done so yet, please do so. And we're especially still looking for uh, student and postdoc nominees. Um, now, I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Fernando Campos, Assistant Professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Texas at San Antonio. Fernando received his bachelor's degree from Caltech and both his master's and PhD from the University of Calgary. And then he held several pos positions after receiving his PhD, including Professor of the Practice at Tulane and a postdoctoral position at Duke before accepting his current position at UTSA in 2018. His lab is focused on understanding behavioral responses to changing environmental conditions, whether those are changes in the physical or social environment. And he studies those questions in natural primate populations, including white-faced capuchins at Santa Rosa and savannah baboons at Amboseli. And he also does some really beautiful comparative work across primate species. What I really admire about Fernando's work is the breadth of the topics and analytical approaches that he brings to bear on the question of how changing environmental conditions affect behavior and life history. So for Fernando, that umbrella includes a wide range of topics, including individual and po population level responses to climate change and establishing conservation priorities for, con uh, for critically endangered species, while also encompassing basic questions of how social bonds, movement ecology and predation risk affect individual outcomes. So there's just this really broad, rich set of questions that he's able to ask and answer. And if you haven't seen Fernando give a talk before, you'll soon learn that he gives some of the most visually beautiful talks that I've ever seen. So it's a real treat. Uh, and with that, I will turn things over to Fernando. All right, well, thank you very much, Matthew, for that, uh, for that great introduction. And I um, also wanna say thanks to Matthew for organizing this, um, this series. It's been a really great uh, series of talks. Um, I know these last few weeks and months have been challenging in so many ways for, for everybody really. Um, and so for those of you who are watching and, and listening, I just wanna say um, thanks for tuning in and um, hope you're doing okay. All right, so as Matthew said, uh, my talk today is gonna to focus on um, the biodemography of health and fitness in changing environments um, with focus on wild primates. And so I wanted to start by just talking about what this means um, by sort of giving a broad conceptual overview um, of the themes that, that sort of um, run throughout the different projects that I'm gonna talk about today. Okay, so what I mean by uh, biodemography, to put it simply, is it's the study of factors that, um, that affect mortality, health, and fertility in, uh, in populations. And so in particular, I'm interested in the causes of individ individual variation in these important life outcomes. Um, and this means asking questions like, why do some individuals live longer than others? Um, why are some individuals more reproductively successful than others? Uh, these are the, the big questions that motivate my research. All right, and so to, to investigate those kinds of questions, um, what we need to do is understand the links between those life outcomes and the many different interrelated factors that contribute to them. So this includes things like uh, biological factors, including genetics, sex differences, age differences, um, but the environment also plays a critical role. And so here I'm, I'm using the, the word environment in a very broad sense to include things in the physical environment like 
diet, climate pathogens, and species, species interactions, um, but also the social environment, right? So here I'm talking about things like social status, uh, social bonding and social isolation, early life social adversity. And the projects that I'm going to talk about today um, really emphasize the important influence of the, of the social environment, okay? So this important role of social factors is, is the focus of a recent review that, um, th that I participated in. Uh, so this is uh, a review that was led by Noah Snyder Mackler and Jenny Tung. Um, and the main point of the review was that humans and non-human animals have um, remarkably parallel patterns in terms of how social factors like uh, social integration, social status, and, and early life social adversity are related to survival and health outcomes. And, and so understanding the biology that underlies these, you know, these differences in, in social environments um, might be helpful in, in terms of providing opportunities for effective intervention, even in human populations. All right. So the last sort of major um, conceptual theme of the projects I'm gonna talk about today is using primates as models of human health and human evolution. Um, and in particular, long-term studies of natural populations of primates um, to gain some of these you know, uniquely valuable insights, right? And the idea here is that primate models, you know, they've been really instrumental in terms of understanding um, disease, development, behavior, cognition. Um, and the great thing about primate models is that they show all of these interesting parallels to humans in terms of you know, biology, behavior, social systems, and so on. But the system is much less complex and it's also um, accelerated. So primates, you know, non-human primates don't live as long as humans, okay. All right, so the first uh, primate model that I'm, that I'm gonna talk about in my research is uh, the Amboseli Baboon Research Project. Okay, so this is a, one of the longest running primate research projects in the world. Uh, these are the four directors of the project. So Gene Altman, Susan Alberts, Beth Archie, and Jenny Tung. Um, so this is, uh, oh, and sorry, this is the, um, the field team that has collected uh, much of the data um, for, for this project. So I just want to acknowledge their um, crucial contributions here. So this uh, study site is located in Southern Kenya. Uh, it's the little red, um, little red, area that you see here, located in Amboseli National Park, close to the border of Tanzania. Um, and so the first research question that I'm going to focus on in this talk is this question of how social adversity is related to survival over the natural lifespan of primates. Okay, so let me provide a little bit of context here. Um, so one of the, the, um, the points that's emphasized in that review that I talked about is that social adversity, including social status and, and social integration. So adversity being having low social status or having low social integration um, is associated with all sorts of, of negative health outcomes in shorter lifespan, uh, both in humans and in non-human animals. Okay. Um, so to provide some sort of broader context with humans, this relationship um, was sort of uh, uh, developed, uh, or sorry, um, noticed uh, for one of the first times uh, from the famous Whitehall studies of uh, British civil servants, right? So these are people that are employed in the, um, the system of, of uh, bureaucracy in, in, in the uh, government of the UK. Right? And so these studies showed that health disparities among British civil servants were strongly predicted by the person's employment grade, or in other words, their position in that hierarchy. And so this is one of the first population studies that, that documented this effect. Um, and uh, more recent effects have you know, vastly uh, increased the, you know, the sample size here. So this is a, a recent study uh, by, uh, led by Raj Chetty um, that looked at in the US, uh, the relationship between um, socioeconomic status, which was measured in this study by household income percentile um, and the expected age of death, assuming you live to age 40. And what you see here, and, and so this is based on about 1.4 billion de-identified US tax records over a 15 year period. What you see here is this very regular relationship between um, increasing household income percentile 
and life expectancy. And so the differences between people at the bottom 1% and the, and the, um, the top 1% um, can exceed, you know, and life expectancy can exceed 10 years. Right? And you also see this strong sex difference, right? So women live longer than men, uh, but you also see the, the strong effect of, of uh, socioeconomic status. Okay, um, and so, so that's, that's the, the influence of social status or the relationship between social status and, and health, fitness, and lifespan. Um, looking at social integration, we also see sort of the similar patterns, right? Um, so one of the first population studies to look at this in humans um, was led by uh, Lisa Berkman um, and Leonard Syme that looked at the relationship between uh, community participation and having sort of social support. Um, and again, uh, life expectancy or, or the probability of being alive after a, a follow-up period. Okay, and what they found is that people who lack social and community ties um, face a, a, an increased risk of death from various causes um, that's independent of other risk factors like smoking or differences in physical activity or socioeconomic status, right? Okay, and so, yeah, this was a, a study from, the, from 1979 and in, in the years since, there've been hundreds of studies that have um, sort of strengthened the evidence in favor of, of this linkage. Um, these were summarized in a meta-analysis uh, that was led by Julianne Holt Lundstedt that looked at 148 different studies of humans um, that represented over 300,000 subjects um, that essentially recapitulated this finding and, and provides very strong support. Okay, so how does this relate to animals? What, what's, what's the relationship in non-human animals? Well, to sort of tie this back to um, the, the very first talk in this, in this long-term animal research series by Joan Silk, um, Joan Silk led one of the first, or to my knowledge, the first study of, uh, in non-human animals that showed a very parallel link here. So in, in this 2010 study um, that, that Joan led, um, one of the key findings was that in Chakma baboons in Botswana, females that had str uh, stronger social relationships um, lived longer. And in addition to that, females who were higher ranking lived longer, right? So these are closely paralleling the, the findings from human studies. Okay, so in the years since there's been um, lots of different studies in many different species. This is another figure from that recent review um, that have um, provided further evidence for this in other species. Okay, so this is, um, in, in this figure here, what you see is the different species where this relationship has been studied, right? Um, the, this, this I, uh, sorry, this column here is the sample size. Um, this column here shows which sex was studied and then the blue, um, the blue arrows and the blue text here indicate rows in or studies in which the observed effect was improved survival with higher social status. Okay, so this is this is social status and survival in wild animals. Okay, so we again we we, we um, know this this effect exists in humans. If we look at the non-human primates, um, this has been um, found in, in a variety of non-human primates, but only females have been studied here. Okay. Likewise, if we look at social integration and survival, again, we see um, this is the, the, the previously discussed effect for humans. Um, among the non-human primates, again, only females have been studied with the exception of Barbary macaques. Um, and in that Barbary macaque study, it wasn't a study of the, um, it wasn't a full life course study. It was a sort of a natural experiment looking at survival of a single unusually cold winter. Okay, so uh, to summarize all non-human primate studies thus far that I'm aware of have, that have analyzed the relationship between social adversity and survival um, have been conducted on females, right? Uh, oh, so over the natural lifespan, okay? So that kind of sets up the question that, that we're trying to address in, this, in the first project that I'm talking about today, which is, do high social status and social integration also enhance longevity in male baboons as they do in men? Okay, so some of the important collaborators on this project include um, uh, Pancho Villavicencio, who is currently at John Hopkins, 
um, and Fernando Colchero, who is at the University of Southern Denmark. Um, so they, they have expertise in sort of Bayesian mortality models um, with sparse or missing data. Okay, so what is the, the problem here? Why have most of these, you know, the, the pretty much all of these um, studies of non-human primates focused exclusively on female survival? Um, so those of you who, who maybe do long-term studies of primates are probably already thinking of the answer, um, but let me just uh, sort of set up the problem. Um, the problem is this. So imagine this is your study population that consists of three different social groups, okay? Um, in the wild, death is rarely observed. Um, so, you know, in, there, there are um, cases in which maybe you observe a death or you find uh, the individual's body, but in most cases, individuals just disappear, right? Most, sorry, most um, female primates spend their entire lives in a single social group. And so if a female disappears from her study group, you can be quite confident that she's died, right? So this is, this is the pattern in baboons. It's not the pattern in all primates, but um, it's a pattern in many primates, right? So, and, and also because those females have been followed um, in many cases from birth, you also have accurate information on the age at which those females died, okay? And so this, you know, gives us the, the data that are needed for modeling survival um, for females, right? But what, what about males in these societies? Okay, so male primates in, in many of these species, including baboons, typically disperse from their birth groups and they also show higher order dispersal, which means that when most males disappear from the study, their fates are just unknown. Um, and specifically males who disappear from a study group, um, you know, after they reach the dispersal, dispersing age might have died or they might have just dispersed to a new social group that's outside the monitored population. So you can't, you know, you, essentially their fate is unknown. Okay, in addition to this, uh, this, this same pattern of dispersal means that many of the males that are in the study population have immigrated from outside the study population which means that their dates of birth are unknown, all right? And so, you know, experienced observers who are observing these, these, these primates over years can estimate their ages sometimes to within a year or two, but there's still a lot of uncertainty there. And so not only do we not know what exactly happens to these males when they leave or when they disappear, we don't even know how old they were when they, when they disappear, right? So together, these problems prevent us from accumulating enough data on males with known ages at death to model their survival with standard approaches. Okay, so to put this another way, this is the kind of data that can be used in standard survival models. Um, so in other words, all females uh, have this, this kind of relationship where they're born into the study population. Okay, that's represented by these closed circles. We know their ages and there's only two kinds of outcomes, right? So they can die um, or they can be alive to the end of the study. That's called the right censoring. Okay, in either case, we know their age at the time of death or at the, ten, or at the time of right censoring. Okay, if we include males, we have additional possibilities for males who are born into the study population. They can um, migrate out. And in some cases, we know that they've migrated out because you know, observers recognize them and they might spot them in, in an unmonitored group every now and then. Right, um, but we also have this, you know, situation where they have just completely unknown fate. And again, the same four outcomes can happen for immigrant males for which we only have estimated ages. Okay. So, um, you know, these, these are serious problems, but we're not completely in the dark here. Um, so if, you know, if we have a, a long-term study of a population we can get a lot of clues that can help us to figure out what is likely to be happening to these males depending on their, the, the time at which they disappear while properly accounting for all these different sources of, adverse, of uncertainty, right? So as an example, um, like I said, observed deaths are relatively rare, but over several decades of observation, and that's represented by these red dots that are appearing, um, we can build up a reasonable sample size of observed male deaths. So in our specific case, there's 277 males that are included in this study. Death was observed for about 15% of them, okay? 
So when we're trying to interpret male disappearance, we can use this as a sort of prior information about the likelihood that death occurred given the age at, at the, the time of disappearance of, of the male. Okay. In addition to that, over long-term study, observers record cases of um, you know, first time or natal dispersal by males who are born into a study group and that sometimes transfer to another study group. Right? So we, we sort of have the ages at which natal dispersal tends to occur. Sometimes we also observe cases of higher order dispersal. Um, you know, if we see um, non-residents dispersing among study groups or, you know, individuals who are spotted in unmonitored groups. And this allows us to accumulate enough cases of, um, of, of ages at dispersal to again, have prior information about the likelihood of natal dispersal occurring or higher order dispersal occurring, depending on the time at which the male disappeared, right? And so collectively, these things can give us, you know, enough information um, to sort of model what's likely to be happening with these pr really problematic cases where the male has, simply has unknown fate, right? Um, and importantly, we're not, you know, we're not just um, sort of guessing and then, and then assuming that that's the correct uh, fate for these males. All of this, these sources of uncertainty, right? So these are, these are probabilities. They're not, they're not um, you know, um, th there's still uncertainty associated here. All of these different sources of uncertainty have to remain in the model to be properly accounted for in the outputs. Okay, so this model was first developed in, in a paper in 2016. Um, that was described by, by Colchero et al. But an important limitation of this model was that it didn't allow for covariates of survival. And that's, that's essential for asking questions like how are social, and, you know, social factors that change over the animal's life, like the social status or social integration, um, how are those related to survival, right? We need to include these covariates of survival. Right, that's the that's the focus of, of this 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 um, this study. So that's what we did in a paper that's currently in press at um, Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, uh, and this is my co-first author on the paper, uh, Pancho Villavicencio. So we took this model that allows us to estimate these trajectories of survival and of mortality over time, and we modified it to allow these time varying aspects of the social environment. Um, to be included as covariates of survival to evaluate how they, how, you know, their relationship with survival. Okay, so in males, especially some of these different variables, um, so bond strength or social status have complex nonlinear relationships with age. And so, um, you know, in, in, in particular in males, what we see is these, these variables tend to peak around you know, in early adulthood when males were kind of in their prime. And so what we did was we standardized all these covariates by age um, to remove these, these trends that the question sort of becomes, how is survival related to the deviation from the typical value that you would expect given um, a baboon's age and sex, right? So if you're relatively high for, for your age, or relatively low for your age, how is that related to survival? Okay. All right, to measure bond strength, we used a uh, dyadic sociality index that's based on grooming frequencies among dyads. Uh, and in particular, it takes the average bond strength for the top three grooming partners. So that's represented here. We have grooming networks for five different social groups. This is our focal individual. Um, the top three grooming partners. So, so the strength of the bond is, is symbolized by these, these um, edges between the different nodes. The top three grooming partners are highlighted in green here. And so this is our measure of, of bond strength. So we looked at bond strength both with uh, male grooming partners and with female grooming partners, um, except that male, male baboons in this population don't groom, groom other males. So for males, we only have bond strength with females, okay? Um, this is a, a representation of the model. I'm not going to run through the steps. I just sort of wanted to give you um, um, an idea of, of the, the different 
sort of steps that are involved. Um, the key points in the model are that it allows us to estimate age-specific mortality when age is uncertain and when individuals can out-migrate and, and therefore disappear with unknown fate. It allows for time-varying covariates of survival that change over the life course. And it propagates all the different sources of uncertainty through to the outputs. Okay. So if, if there's simply not enough information contained in the, in the actual data, um, what we're going to get is no effects rather than spurious effects. Okay, so these plots depict kind of the summary of the results. Um, and what they show is the estimated associations between social variables and survival here for females first. Um, and so these are, um, these are posterior densities of the parameters. So just sort of to, to interpret this, higher values over here indicate higher mortality risk associated with stronger bonds and negative values over here represent lower mortality risk associated with stronger bonds. So this is for, for bonds with females, bonds with males and for social status, right? So higher mortality risk associated with um, high status over here and, and vice versa. Okay, so what, what we see here are findings that recapitulate the, the Silk et al. study that I've talked about and also that recapitulate previous work in this populations for females. This is just kind of a sanity check to make sure that we can still you know, detect these known effects of, of um, you know, social integration and, and social status on survival. Um, higher social dominance rank does not predict lifespan in females of this population, although it did for the Chakma baboons. Um, but this is consistent with sort of previous, previously known uh, findings, okay? So this is the, the results for the males. And what we find is that male baboons that have strong social bonds to females uh, have lower mortality risk throughout life. And so specifically, they experience about 28% reductions in uh, mortality hazard in any given year compared to um, males with um, weak social bonds to females, right? In addition to that, what we see down here is some evidence, you know, it's not quite as strong, but it's still suggestive that males who maintain higher social status for their age tend to have shorter lifespans. Okay, so this kind of points to this, an, an interesting possible trade-off between um, maintaining high social status and possibly shorter lifespans. So in terms of you know, the, the significance of, of this study, what we, what we have I think is the first evidence in a wild primate that males like females show this strong link between um, social bond strength and survival over their natural lifespans. And again, we, we, we have the suggestive evidence of possible trade-offs between lifespan and um, and social status. So, you know, social status is closely related to reproductive success in male baboons. They compete intensely for it. So there could be, you know, benefits to um, maintaining high social status despite the possible drawbacks in terms of reduced lifespan. Um, this also kind of raises this, this question of why does lifespan matter at all for males, right? So there's, you know, I think a, a common view in, in um, evolutionary biology that in species where males compete intensely for, um, for mating opportunities, that um, lifespan really isn't an important determinant of fitness in, in males. Um, but what we see is in male baboons, you know, if we look at Amboseli, male baboons who live longer, um, you know, there, many, many male baboons die during their prime years. And so males who live longer often that means surviving through the prime reproductive ages. Um, and so in essentially in both sexes of baboons, variation in lifespan has uh, the largest effect on fitness, um, even larger than variation in fertility. Okay, so linking this back to Joan Silk's talk that sort of kicked off this long-term animal research seminar series, um, I think this finding kind of brings new understanding to why male baboons um, may form long lasting social bonds or friendships with female baboons. Yes, there, there is, you know, they can protect their, their offspring from infanticide risk, but these bonds could also have direct benefits to the males themselves, uh, perhaps by enhancing lifespan. 
Okay, so the, the next project that I'm going to talk about um, kind of involves an important unresolved question here, which is what physiological mechanisms link social adversity with health and survival, right? So let me again give some context here that kind of sets up many of the, the, the challenges that are associated with answering this question. Okay, so, you know, returning again to the human literature in humans, um, the prevailing model for how um, we get negative impacts of social adversity on health and survival um, sort of invokes the influence of chronic stress. So exposure to chronic social stressors in particular, and you know, decades of research on humans clearly indicate that chronic stress can have um, negative impact, you know, negative effects on a variety of different, um, in a variety of different ways. So you know, it's associated with anxiety, um, with insomnia, high blood pressure. Um, it can lead to obesity, heart disease, other you know, poor disease outcomes. Um, and this, you know, this long-term research on humans also clearly indicates that this. You know this impairment in the body's ability to um, the, sorry that this effect is kind of related to the body's um, loss of the ability to properly regulate signaling molecules, and that this maybe plays a, an important role in this process. Okay, so a lot of attention here is focused on um, metabolic hormones such as glucocorticoids that are produced as part of the body. You know, they're produced by the body's um, HPA axis that in response to a wide variety of different challenges, right? So this has kind of been a focus of, of, of human research and how social adversity could be linked to these negative health and survival outcomes. All right, there's also supporting evidence from laboratory animal studies that, you know, that provide strong support for this idea. Um, so this particular study, the 2018 study by Rezzoli and colleagues um, strongly supports the idea that social adversity can causally affect health and survival, and that this is mediated by our endo by endocrine systems. Okay. So in particular, what they, what they did is they, they created a mouse model of chronic stress, chronic social stress, in which you have identical environments, um, genetically identical mice that are exposed to um, chronic social stress, in this case, exposure to a dominant mouse. Um, and what they, see, what they found was that you have sort of two outcomes that are determined by differences in coping style. So in mice that have a more passive coping style, there's evidence of endocrine dysfunction um, leading to higher, so that, that leads to you know, all sorts of metabolic problems, um, including reduced survival. And they also show roughly twofold uh, increases in their average GC profile. So GC here meaning glucocorticoids, okay. So again, sort of implying that there's this, this, this uh, causal relationship between endocrine dysfunction and reduced survival, okay. There's still a question of whether these findings are artifacts of captivity um, and whether, you know, these kinds of mechanisms um, could play a role in natural populations at all. Um, you know, despite this, this uncertainty, there's been a ton of interest in the relationship between glucocorticoids and fitness in wild animals. So just as, as an example here, this is a, a Google Scholar search that I did uh, yesterday on glucocorticoids and fitness in wild animals. Um, since, tw you know, since 2020, it pulls up about 600 results. Um, so area of intense interest, um, but there's still, you know, a major question of whether GCs are related to fitness in wild animals. Um, and in particular, there's, there's this important gap or disconnect between human studies, laboratory animal studies, and wild animal studies. Right. Um, there have been a, a number of really great reviews that have discussed why it's so challenging to um, kind of make these links between endocrine responses and fitness in wild animals, right? So this is um, uh, a review by Breuner et al. in uh, 2008, uh, uh, Francis Bonnier in 2009, uh, Boonstra 2013. Uh, and so, you know, various reviews that have discussed the challenges here. And what, the, what these reviews argue is that animals in their natural environments are unlikely to experience chronic stress 
you know, at least not to the, the, to the degree that it could affect their fitness, right? So why specifically, what's the problem here? Um, so the idea kind of goes, the idea is old. Uh, so it goes back to, you know, Robert Sapolsky's work. Um, and the idea is that the, the kinds of stressors that wild animals experience, or at least that they routinely experience, like being chased by a predator, um, are often acute and life-threatening, okay? And so, you know, let's say that this gazelle is, is able to, you know, avoid some small amount of cellular damage or inflammation or whatever by not mounting a strong uh, GC response to deal with this challenge. You know, it's not gonna be able to enjoy that as it's being digested by the cheetah, right? So, you know, mounting this strong stress response in the wild um, is, is essentially always adaptive in, you know, for dealing with these kinds of challenges. So, you know, what these reviews argue is that under such circumstances, it's, it's unlikely that the HPA axis or other, you know, endocrine systems are gonna fall into this state of dysregulation. And so you wouldn't expect to find any fitness costs of elevated GCs beyond those that are already, you know, imposed by whatever environmental challenge that animal's facing. Okay, so to, to kind of explain this in a different way, um, you know, if we have these two different animals in, in, in different environments, we have, you know, this, this baboon on the left here experiences more frequent or more intense environmental stressors. We could get this relationship where this baboon experiences a higher average GC profile. It also experiences reduced fitness. Um, in contrast, we have you know, this other situation where a baboon in a better environment experiences less frequent or less intense environmental stressors. It has a lower average GC profile, enhanced fitness, but the relationship, but you know, th these, these arrows here are argued not to exist. So what we have is it's the environmental differences that are sort of causing both of these things. All right, so this is related to an idea that's called the um, optimal endocrine phenotype hypothesis, which is the idea that each individual, so, so each of these individuals, the baboon in the poor environment, the baboon in the good environment is responding optimally to its current environmental challenges. And so if you, if you get variation among individuals in their GC profiles, what that reflects is just the differences in the challenges that they face. And because both individuals are responding optimally, um, there's no, you know, there's no harmful effects of the average, higher average GC profile, because if either of these animals had responded differently, um, they'd have even, even worse fitness, okay? So, you know, disproving this idea in a wild, unmanipulated system, um, it's really difficult, it might, you know, might be impossible. What you would need is, you know, identical baboons in identical environments that mount different GC responses to a specific challenge uh, to compare their, their, their outcomes, okay. All right, um, so, you know, an, an, an alternate idea is that there might be some genetic, or, you know, some, some kind of variation among individuals um, that causes some individuals to have more or less optimal endocrine responses. All right, so th in this idea, let's say you can somehow statistically control the environments. Um, some individuals may show less optimal endocrine traits. Some individuals may show more, show more optimal endocrine traits. Uh, so this phenotypic variation may be caused by genetics or, or some other factors um, that influence you know, the, the optimality of the endocrine traits. And that this leads to, you know, this, this again leads to differences in the residual GC profiles, um, which allows for the possibility of an arrow between the, the endocrine response and the fitness outcome. Okay. So let's get back to this question of whether chronic stress exists at all in social, in social mammals. Um, so there is some evidence that we might have, you know, chronic social stress occurring in social mammals. Right, so if we go back to Sapolsky's work again, um, Sapolsky argued that most animals don't show chronic stress in nature. Um, but if we do find chronic stress in nature, he argued that we're likely to find it in social, you know, social primates and other social mammals where um, you know, individuals 
uh, live in these, these social environments, they're not say genetically programmed from birth to be low ranking or high ranking. It's a social force that's kind of imposed on them and that, 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 they, that they have to you know, deal with uh, continually. And uh, Sapolsky's work showed that you know, socially stressed baboons that occupy low positions in, the, in their dominance hierarchies do so show signs of pathological hyperactivity of the HPA axis that, that kind of parallel um, the human studies. A recent study from uh, Melissa Emery Thompson's lab, um, this is a 2020 study, showed that um, as chimpanzees age, we also see some evidence of uh, progressive dysregulation, again, suggesting that there's you know, variation among individuals in the optimality of HPA axis function, right? So individuals can age at different rates. And so that this leaves open the possibility that you know, same age individuals are responding differentially to, to similar environmental stressors. Okay, some of these same patterns have been observed in baboons as well. And the kinds of, you know, the kinds of changes that, that uh, were observed in this, this study of chimpanzees were overproduction of glucocorticoids with increasing age and also uh, blunting of, of GC responses that again, kind of indicate impaired regulation. Okay, and then maybe the, the strongest study of the the strongest evidence, so th this is not from the wild, um, that chronic social stress can, can um, affect uh, non-human primates, social primates, is that if you experimentally manipulate the amount of social stress that macaques experience in this case, what we get is causal changes in genes that are involved in inflammation, immune function, and glucocorticoid signaling, right? So this is, um, based on studies from Noah Snyder-Mackler, Jenny Tung, and, and, and various colleagues. Okay. So, you know, kind of going back to this, this question, you know, does chronic stress play a role in, in this, these linkages between social adversity and, and health and survival outcomes? Um, a, a really great review by uh, Jacinta Biener and, and Tori Bergman in 2017 kind of emphasized the need to increase research on relationships between glucocorticoid secretion and fitness. And one of the really remarkable findings from this review was that um, at the time, at least not a single wild primate study, they argued has established this connection between environmental factors, stress responses and fitness. Okay, so that, and that's kind of like the gap that we're aiming to, to contribute to here. Okay, so what can we, what can we contribute to this conversation? Um, for one thing, in the Ambacelli population, we have a really large sample of repeated, non-invasive, um, integrative measures of GC over the life course. Right? Uh, non-invasive meaning you know, they're, they're based on the collection of fecal samples. And so we can repeatedly measure, um, we can get repeated G GC measurements from individuals over their lifespans without affecting the animal's behavior, or its endocrine status. Like, you know, compared to, for example, darting the animal or restraining the animal and drawing blood. Okay, and you know, fecal samples are also kind of integrative measures of GCs because they they kind of reflect these cumulative secretion pat GC secretion patterns over periods of hours to days. And so, when you have elevated uh, you know metabolites of GCs in the feces, what that suggests is increased overall exposure to to, to uh, elevated GC concentrations. Okay, and it, it's that overall increased exposure that's associated with um, stress-induced disease in humans, okay? We also have a really strong foundation of known sources of variation in, in GCs in this population and, and also in survival. Um, these are some of the, the people who have led studies um, on the causes of GC variation in this population. Um, and so that, you know, this is, this is a great data set to kind of try to test some of these questions. Okay, let me just briefly talk about the data here, right? Um, so this is a representation of a single female baboon's um, lifespan. Okay, this is a, a, an actual baboon named Scenic. Um, this is the start of adulthood. So we, we're lo only, only looking at adult female baboons here. Start of adulthood at age five, she died at age 14.1. Um, and here you see 77 FGC samples that were collected over her life course, right? So this represents nine life years of data 
um, you know, think you know, the, the 77 different measurements of integrative GC on this one particular female. Okay. We can place this one female's timeline um, in this, this plot here. And then this is the entire data set that I'm, that I'm talking about here. Um, it represents 242 adult females, 1,634 life years, and over 14,000 FGC measurements. The red dots here represent females that died. And if, you, if it doesn't have a red dot, it means she was still alive at the, at the end of the study. Um, so, you know, we can just take a moment to reflect on how much time and, and resources um, and money and, and everything, you know, went into the production of this data set. Um, it's, it's really incredible. Okay, um, so, you know, modeling the, the, this, this relationship is, is also kind of complicated. So we have um, two different processes that, that we're interested in modeling. Uh, first, we have um, observed FGC measurements, right? So that's here. And we have these observed or known covariates that influence FGC values. Right. Um, and so we, I'm going to refer to this as the longitudinal subprocess. So longitudinal meaning you have repeated measurements of the same individuals over time. So we have this sort of clustering within individuals um, and then lots of different individuals. Okay. The typical way of modeling a longitudinal process like this is called um, a, a generalized or a linear mixed model. Um, so we have this kind of um, grouping factor of individual. So this is captured by subject specific random effects. Um, and so this, this is a, the way to model this longitudinal process. And in, in, in this particular model, we have, we, we sort of allow individuals um, FGC profiles to follow individual specific trajectories by including, um, you know, uh, random intercepts and random slopes of age for each individual. We also have this time to event subprocess, right? So we're interested in the time to death. So how long do these individuals survive, right? So we have, in addition to, to our longitudinal subprocess, we have things that we know influence survival like social bonds, right? Um, th those sorts of things. Uh, and we want to include information about from the longitudinal subprocess as a predictor of the time to event. Um, one way of doing this, so, so the typical way of, of modeling a time to event subprocess is called a survival model, right? Um, what we do to include these, these time varying biomarkers, right, um, is, is specify an association structure between these two different subprocesses, right? So, and this association structure is it's, a, it's an unobserved variable, like an un, unobserved process that captures the association between the biomarker and the time of death, All right? And we, uh, we estimate these two different subprocesses simultaneously using an approach called joint modeling, okay? So to, to sort of look at the, the, some examples of raw data here, these are 12 randomly selected individuals. Um, these little dots represent the log of, of their FGC uh, as measured in their fecal samples. Um, the red dashed lines show the time of death or the time of right censoring, okay? Um, this is the model, you know, the, the, the model's um, estimates of the longitudinal biomarker that sort of vary smoothly over time. So we, we're kind of assuming that we have these imperfect measurements of this longitudinal process that, you know, that, that is different in each in each female, right? Each female follows her own sort of um, GC profile over time. This is the time to event. And we can specify different association structures. So one, one association structure that we might be interested in is what's the relationship between the current value of that female's um, FGC process? How is that, you know, can we include that as a time varying predictor of her survival? Okay, another possible uh, association structure is looking at the cumulative effect, right? So at each, at each point in time, um, we measure the, the sort of the, the, um, the path integral of, of this process and we, we compare individuals that died to individuals that didn't die. And we say, does this cumulative effect um, predict female survival, okay? And so, you know, to, to show some 
some results. So I'm, I'm, here I'm showing the um, cumulative effect uh, association structure. We have these various factors that influence um, FGC values. I wanna draw particular attention to this area under the FGC profile. So that's, that's the sort of cumulative effect of the, the female's FGC profile included as a time variant predictor of her survival. And what we see is that higher, um, you know, these higher integrative GCs predict higher mortality risk. To get a sense of the, the magnitude of this, this estimated effect, um, we can simulate FGC profiles for two hypothetical individuals that consistently stay high or low. Um, you know, so th this is a female that's consistently high. Um, this is a female that's consistently low. This represents the, the um, time at right censoring. So we're assuming that both of these females survive to age 14. Um, and then we can predict their survival based on this cumulative effect, right? Um, and so in this case, you know, if you survive to, to age 14 um, and we have no association here, so we're not including any information about the female's FGC uh, profile, um, we get identical survival, right? Because there's no, there's no additional information provided um, from the FGC profile. Okay, so we'll call this the null association structure in the cumulative effect association structure, what we see is this difference in, 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 um, in survival probability that um, you know, is about 4.8 years. So that's about a quarter of a, baboon, of a female baboon's total life expectancy. Um, that, that's, that's sort of the estimated magnitude of this effect for this simulated high female and low female. Okay, so getting back to this question, what's this relationship between GC secretion and fitness in baboons? Um, there's some things that we can conclude and some that we're still kind of probing at. Um, one thing that we can conclude is that these integrated GC levels are very strong predictors of female survival in wild baboons, and this, that this relationship persists after controlling for known sources of variation in both the GCs and survival. Um, it's consistent with two different interpretations. Uh, and both of these interpretations could be true to some extent. Um, one interpretation is that um, there's still unmeasured environmental factors that continue to drive this relationship, right? And so maybe, you know, these are still completely optimal responses and it's, it's all driven by unmeasured environmental factors. Um, it's impossible to really rule that out. Another, even though we've tried as best as possible to sort of control for environmental differences. Okay, another interpretation is that what we could be seeing is negative health effects that are associated with chronic HPA axis activation and, and that this reduces lifespan. And like I said, both of these different interpretations could be, you know, true to some extent in, in, in contributing to this effect that we see. Okay, so, um, winding down on time. So I just want to talk about one last um, project uh, briefly um, that's uh, part of the, the Area de Conservación Guanacaste primate project in Santa Rosa, Costa Rica. Um, so the, the, the Capuchin project that, that um, in Costa Rica here is led by Dr. Linda Fedigan, uh, Catherine Jack and Amanda Moline. And some other key uh, collaborators for this particular project are Urs Kalbitzer, Jeremy Hogan, and uh, Filippo Aureli. Um, this is the location of the study site in Northwestern Costa Rica. Um, and this particular site supports three different species of primates, the mantled howler, the white-faced capuchin, and the black-handed spider monkey. Um, so this particular project that I'm gonna talk about has um, so it focuses on the spider monkeys and on the capuchins. And what we're asking is what are the important um, environmental factors, both social and ecological, that affect infant mortality in these two populations? And in particular, we're interested in whether infant mortality rates in these two species um, show similar responses to the same environmental factors, okay? So in capuchins, we know from previous research that one of the most important influences on survival is a, a, a social factor, right? So male infanticide accounts for um, a major portion of infant mortality in this population um, during periods of, 
infanticide risk, about 60% of infants die um, compared to about 20% of infants during stable periods. And so this is a, you know, a major effect. We don't see evidence for infanticide as a regular occurrence in spider monkeys. Um, and in spider monkeys, there's no previous studies in this population that I'm aware of that have focused on um, you know, the factors that influence infant mortality at all. Okay, um, in this particular study, we're interested in some uh, ecological factors like the occurrence of drought, which is a regular, um, well, I should say irregular, but you know, um, potentially severe uh, uh, component of, of the environment here. So this causes water stress. Um, and also there's, there's a lot of variation of food availability at this site that um, may be related to nutritional or, or energy stress. So in this project, we considered the possibility that the effects of these, you know, these different variables on survival could sort of act as a linear function um, so that you know, any increasing amount of drought risk increases uh, infant mortality, or there could be threshold functions where you, know, you only really get effects if you get a really severe drought or a really you know, severe um, you know, deficit in, in food availability, okay? Um, and, and again, we use survival models to, to look at the influence of uh, these you know, various uh, drought related and food related factors and also social factors on um, the risk of death uh, over different time periods and using these both linear and threshold functions. Okay. So uh, just to summarize briefly, uh, since we're running out of time, um, the, the results for the capuchins, what we see is that um, the presence of extreme drought in capuchins was a very strong predictor of, um, of infant mortality. So here, higher values here indicate kind of excess risk over the typical year associated with different years of study. Um, the red shading indicates severe drought years. Um, and what we see is, you know, when there's severe drought, and this is kind of like a threshold effect, during the extreme drought, we get uh, elevated infant mortality risk in capuchins. In spider monkeys, um, what we see is, is this sort of continuous effect of fruit biomass um, that influences spider monkey infant mortality, such that when fruit biomass is very low, that's, that's indicated by these red, red shadings, we get elevated mortality risk. And when fruit biomass is high, that's the blue, we get reduced mortality risk. Um, and so to kind of to summarize this, this, this project, um, this plot shows the proportion of infants surviving for um, infant capuchins and infant spider monkeys during periods of high infanticide risk versus low infanticide risk, high drought versus low drought. Um, and so these different curves show, so the red here is high infanticide risk and drought in which maybe only 10% or less of infants survive to age one versus uh, years with low infanticide risk and no drought where infant survival is closer to 80%, right? And in infant spider monkeys, this is the difference between um, periods of high food availability and low food availability. So what factors have greatest impact on infant mortality in each species? You know, in capuchins, we see very strong relationships between infanticide and drought on infant mortality. Um, the magnitude of the, the effect of infanticide is greater, but they can sort of compound each other. Uh, whereas in spider monkeys, infant survival was best predicted by food availability. And because infants aren't actually consuming the fruit, we think this is mediated by the mother. Uh, so maybe, you know, this having low food availability causes, um, you know, maternal condition to kind of suffer. And that this is, this is sort of what causes this mortality effect. We were surprised to not see an effect of drought on the spider monkeys, but we think that this is probably because there were so few infants born during drought conditions at all uh, in the spider monkeys. There were long gaps in, in the, the birth record in spider monkeys that are associated with drought. And so we think that you know, reproduction may be inhibited or even you know, spontaneously terminated in female spider monkeys during periods of severe drought. And then maybe that's why, this, why drought doesn't emerge as an important determinant of infant spider monkeys, we just don't have enough data, okay. Okay, so um, I think I'll leave it at that and um, I'll send it back to you, Matthew. 
That was really terrific. Thank you, Fernando. Um, people can still put in some questions. For now, we have a couple, and I have one too. Let's start okay. with uh, one from Mark Halber about the first study that you described, the differences mm -hmm. in, in effects of social status on, on different, on males and females. Um, he asks, are there any data on human populations or cultures where dispersing individuals, whether they're females or males, have shorter lifespans as compared to phylopatric individuals? Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting question. I, I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, yeah, I don't know the human literature quite as well as the animal literature, um, even though it informs a lot of this work. Um, but that's it's a, it's a great question that unfortunately I don't know the answer to. Okay, uh, Susan Alberts has a question about the last part of your talk. She asks, mm -hmm. what strategies, if any, do capuchin mothers employ to reduce infanticide risk? And do they seem sensitive to differences over time in that risk? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it seems like female capuchins have very limited ability to, um, to sort of uh, combat infanticide risk. And, um, you know, an interesting study that was led by Urs Kalbitzer in 2017 showed that it's actually the females that are most sociable that have highest um, infant mortality during infanticide risk. Uh, which we think is, you know, it's, it's reflecting the fact that the most sociable females are right in the center of the group where these potentially dangerous males are. Um, it's surprising that, you know, we don't see any evidence that these females are kind of um, reducing their sociality to sort of mitigate these risks. Um, this is still work that, you know, that, um, like I said, it, Rose Kalbitzer has led that, that he's still looking into um, that I'm, that I'm uh, collaborating with him on. Um, but again, it, it seems like capuchin females have very limited ability to, to, um, to combat these risks. And part of it could be that just the difference in body size, um, that male capuchins are quite a bit larger. Um, and you know, all they need is, is, is one opportunity to, to sort of, um, to, to, to commit that infanticide. I don't know if I missed the second part of the question. Could you? Uh, it was whether or not, you know, if they have these strategies, whether they seem to be sensitive to variation in infanticide risk over time. Yeah, so maybe I did kind of um, uh, answer that, which is that um, the data so far suggests no, but um, we haven't really tried to look at very, like fine grain variation in sociality if that changes as a function of risk. So that's, that's, that's a project that's, that's ongoing. Uh, maybe we'll stay on the last part of the talk for now. A question from Eleanor Caves. She says, can you describe more about the last study, especially the difference between a threshold as compared to a linear model and analyzing the effects of a threshold variable like drought versus a continuous metric like rainfall? Uh, how would that have impacted your findings and or did you test for that? Oh, also this is Patrick Green, by the way. <laughs> yeah, um, so yeah, so, you know, with a threshold variable, there's, um, there's some subjectivity in where you put the threshold, right? And so that can be another thing that you vary, um, or it can be based on sort of ecological information from the site, like um, what level of, um, you know, how much rainfall uh, has to fall before it's, or, or not fall before, before you consider it a severe drought, right? So that there's some subjectivity there. Um, I looked at different, you know, measures or definitions of, of severe drought and also the impact of time, like um, different time windows. And so looking at drought over um, say a one month time window versus a six month time window versus a one year time window. And they're, they're actually drought indices that are, um, that, that, that are specifically designed to measure these different time lags. Um, and, and so, to, you know, to, include one of these variables in, in a model, essentially you, you have to define a threshold and then it becomes a binary indicator of whether that threshold was met at any given time or not, right? if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then maybe we'll finish up with two questions about the GC work. Uh, first from Ben Danzer who says, great talk. I'm interested if you have explored how GC responses to environmental stimuli cause variation in survival or reproduction. That is, there may be some negative environmental co-variation where harsh environments are associated with high GCs and low survival and reproduction, 
but at the individual level, those with high GC responses have higher survival and reproduction as a result of a positive interaction between GC GCs and environmental factor on fitness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, um, th that was not part of, part of this talk. Um, we are currently kind of continuing to probe at this by um, using uh, mediation analyses and also moderation analyses um, to look at the potential for interactions among some of these things. Um, this is ongoing work that you know, I, I really um, don't have, didn't have time to talk about here. But yeah, it's a great point that um, we're kind of looking, you know, the, the, the work that I presented here is kind of like um, in a, at a macro scale, like looking at how integrative GCs measured kind of over the lifetime, um, their, their predictive relationship with survival. Um, it is an important next step to kind of look at the potential for interactions uh, among these different things, yeah. Um, and then I had a question about the GC work too. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you talked about the, the optimal, I'm not quite sure, the optimal something hypothesis where, where there should be this optimal GC response. And if that's the case, it would seem like potentially you would expect both individuals that are especially low in terms of their lifetime GC response and also especially high in terms of their residual GC response to do less well. Is that right? And did, did you look for any, like a nonlinear relationship between GC residuals and, um, and survival? Uh, yeah, so you, what, what you're saying is you could, um, you can mount the wrong response in either direction. You could, you could mount too strong a response and potentially incur costs associated with that or mount too weak a response, right? So that, that's, that's, I mean, that would not be predicted by the, op the, the optimal um, endocrine phenotype hypothesis. So, so the, the key idea there is that um, selection on, on these phenotypes has been so strong that there's very little variation around the optimality. So that's kind of the alternate view is that there is sort of this standing genetic variation or something, you know, phenotypic variation in endocrine responses. Um, and yeah, so, so that, 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 that is a good point that you could potentially find um, sort of uh, associations with reduced fitness in either direction. Yeah. Um, it's not something that, that, that I've, um, considered in this project, but yeah, it's, it's a point well taken. Um, and then maybe I'll just leave with this last comment from Susan Alberts, who said also fantastic talk, beautiful visuals. And I will I'll second that So as always really a beautiful talk. So thank you for not so. um, And next week we'll be hearing from uh, Nancy Chen about population genetics in a long-term study of scrub jays. Uh, it's gonna be really great. So thanks everyone for joining us and we'll see you all next week. And uh, thanks again, Fernando. You're welcome, thanks a lot.